Hi, welcome to our online program. So glad you could join me today. Larry Rogers here, New Horizons Church, and we've got a really good passage of God's Word for you today. It's out of 2 Corinthians 5.10, and it's a, I call the title, Going for the Gold. The Olympics are on right now, and there's a lot of stuff going on. You turn on a lot of channels, there's judo, there's uh, BMX bike, there's track and field of fast sprints, long runs, um, and uh, boxing. I saw women's volleyball. I saw men's volleyball, swimming, all kinds of things to win the prize. It is a big deal. It's so big a deal this year in Tokyo that although we couldn't have it because of COVID in 2020, the 2020 Olympics are in 2021 this year. And Billions of dollars are involved. That tells you that it's important. And athletes from all over the world. But you know, there's another kind of gold. We're talking about the Bible and spiritual things here. There's another kind of gold that we can have. And I want to talk to you about that today. So if you've wanted to be a worker for the Lord, if you feel like, you know, I am a believer, but what's missing in my life? And we could talk about that because we can live a different quality, a higher quality of life than maybe we know. And that's really going for the gold. Living your best life, your best plan to be faithful to God. No greater life can be lived than a person who is faithful to God because it has rewards in this life and the life to come. Join me in prayer, will you? God, thank you for each person that's here today online with me on the other side of that screen or that phone. I pray the words of Scripture will not return void. I pray, God, that you'll heal and strengthen the isolated, the depressed, or just those, Lord, who really want to follow you. Give us a greater hunger for you and strengthen us to do your will. Help us to persevere in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let it be so, it means. All right, ready? Let's get into the scripture, going for the gold. So in 2 Corinthians 5.10, it reads like this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Wait a minute. Judgment seat, that doesn't sound too happy. Stay with me. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done in our body, whether good or bad. Okay, that's the second bad. What have I done? What bad have I done? Uh-oh, more trouble. No, this actually is a tremendous encouragement because this judgment is actually one of four judgments. Let's compare two real quickly. There's the great white throne judgment for unbelievers. Those that reject Christ, those that didn't put their trust in for eternal salvation, they'll face their judgment for their own sins. At this judgment, this is for believers only, those that have put their trust in Christ. And they will receive, each one of us that are believers will receive a reward or rewards from God for what we have done with our life. Well, wait a minute, Larry. I thought that you couldn't work your way to heaven. You can't. So let's just start right here at the starting line. It is grace. It is by grace that you are saved by faith. It's not by your own works, lest any person could brag about it. So salvation purely comes through Christ. All right. So you have to lay the foundation of accepting Christ as Savior. Now, after Christ is in your heart and in your life, then what you do, any act of faith, you get rewarded. Well, Larry, I just am glad to make it. I don't care if I'm in the back seat of heaven, just so I'm there. Well, that's one way to think, but then there's the way that the Bible explains things. We should think biblically. And that is, is that there's more than that. You don't belong in the back seat of heaven. What you belong is, is doing God's will. And that's where we'll be happiest. And we'll live a rich, eternal reward beside being blessed in this life. 
As a Christian, you can have tribulation in this life, and you can have temporal blessings. Matter of fact, some good and bad happens in the same day, a lot of days. But then we're talking about really giving our life to Christ. So when you come to Jesus, that means that you are a Christian. You are a follower of Christ. He has covered your sins, past, present, and in the future. And you're not going to be judged for your sins. However, we still will face an accountability and a responsibility for our life here. And that determines what kind of reward we'll have in the thousand-year millennial ruling and reigning with Christ, the thousand-year kingdom, the millennial reign it's referred to. And it'll also refer to eternity. And so Jesus himself promised rewards. So let's go back to this. Saved by grace through faith, not by works. In the same way, God will reward us by grace based on our faith. A one-word summary of our life based on our faithfulness to Him, because Christianity is about a relationship. It's being as faithful as we can. Now we have choices to make. You can just sit in the back seat of heaven, so to speak, as some people like to say, or uh, as the Bible explains it, you can be a worldly or a carnal Christian, or as it said, an immature Christian, or you can grow in the grace and knowledge of God. You can grow in the faith and you can become strengthened to live a life led by the Holy Spirit. Will you make mistakes? Sure, you and I will, but that's not the point. It's choosing what kind of life. So do you wanna live a worldly life and have God bless you with many worldly things? And that's okay, we can have that, but then we can have a life of faithfulness to God that's even greater that is a life controlled by the Spirit. If you want to read about that, read Romans chapter 8. Some call it the greatest chapter of the Bible. I didn't say I did, but some do. It's that good. It's about life in the Spirit, Romans 8. Read about that if you want. But the idea here is a Spirit-controlled life. So I wrote this down and I want to read this to you. One thing is for sure. God will not owe any person anything ever. He outgives us in every way. That's the nature and the greatness of God. That's why he not only rewards us uh, with heaven for those that have simple faith in him, and he did the work. We just have to believe and trust him. But also he rewards those that love him and serve him and follow him. And he has a function, a purpose, a job for us to do. Our job on earth as believers is to glorify God. Some do it better than others. But one thing's for sure, the key to living a life God rewards is living a life of closeness with God and being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Some call it the Spirit-controlled life. Now. One thing is for sure, God will not owe any person anything ever. And number two, he doesn't make empty promises when he talks about rewards. Jesus said, lay up your treasures in heaven where moth or rust doesn't destroy or thieves can't break in and steal it. In other words, whatever we do, whatever we pray, whatever level of life that we have that are close to God, that is living, being lived close to God, we are going to be rewarded for that just because of God's generosity. No, of course he doesn't have to do it. He doesn't have to save us either, but it's a double blessing, salvation and a reward that you get to choose your level. And it's a challenge and an exciting adventure in life. So consider that. What kind of life do you want to live? Spirit controlled? are worldly, carnal, and just kind of, well, I just hope I can make it in by the, you know, uh, maybe the fire's burning my britches on the way in, hell's fire, but I made it. All right, that's good enough for me. I pray that God gives you a desire to really follow Jesus. See, my testimony in brief is I came to the Lord as a teenager because I didn't want to go to hell. That's really not that bad a reason. Uh, as short-sighted as I was spiritually, I got one thing right. Don't go to hell. 
<laughs> That's the first thing. But you know what I found is an emptiness uh, in following the Lord. And because what happened was I had my ticket and I felt conflicted. Why would I want to go to heaven when there's not the fun stuff that I like to do there? And what had happened, I didn't realize. I really didn't have that much of love for the Lord. I had my ticket for heaven. Falling in love with the Lord and appreciating what he's done on the cross and what he's done for me and what I owe him compared to what I owe anyone or anything in this world, it doesn't even compare. And when you start falling in love with the Lord, you start worshiping Him, you start following Him, and the burdens of, uh, are not there. It doesn't feel burdensome to be religious. You're not carrying a heavy load on your back. God wants to take the heavy load of sin off your back. He doesn't want to put it on. He said, His yoke is easy, His burden is light. And so, uh, I pray that you want to love the Lord and follow the Lord. Now, there's two judgments. Here we go. The great white throne and the Bema seat. The Bema seat is, literally means a raised place, platform. Okay, think of gold and silver and bronze now. Think of the Olympics. There were Scythian games that were played every two years. And so these words are taken and put in the Bible, but the idea here is that the Bema seat is an eternal uh, judgment, uh, but it's a judgment of evaluation. So the official seat of the judge at these Olympics was at the finish line, and it was a raised platform right where everything could be seen and properly evaluated that say the runners didn't foul or push or shove or do something you know unethical or cheat to win the prize and so the judge had the best and then so when they came across he was able to evaluate did they run the race and did they win it fairly who won and here's the reward for it it's the same way uh, in life that there's a judgment called the bema right after uh, the rapture. It's at the rapture, the resurrection. I digress. Let's go a little bit further here. Let me read this. Jesus promised rewards throughout his ministry. An example, speaking of inviting guests to a banquet, told in Luke 14, who can't return the favor. He said, invite people who can't return the favor. He said, and you will be blessed, Luke 14, 14. Although they cannot repay you, Jesus' words, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. What is the resurrection of the righteous where you're going to be repaid for whatever you've done? It is the, after the rapture. The rapture, or the catching away, is when God takes the believers who have died and are alive, the church, to heaven. After that, judgment, the evaluation judgment, of what rewards you would get. Now remember it said, for we must all appear. When the Apostle Paul wrote this, he was talking about himself. Every believer will be there to receive that reward and that evaluation. It says, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body. Okay, so a lot of people just think, well, I made it to heaven, that's it. But we are uh, in seeing a connection between what we do in this life and the next life. That is one of the biggest misnomers, one of the biggest mistakes, one of the most misunderstood things that people fail to make the connection between what we do, what we think, what we say, what we pray is not connected to the next life. It absolutely, it is here. It shows us that it is. So it says, for things done while in the body. Now here again says, whether good or bad. And here's what I want to tell you. That the word here for bad means worthless. It does not mean evil or sin. So when it says, what is due the things done while in the body, whether good or worthless, not good or evil. And so we shouldn't fear this judgment. We should look forward to it 
as somebody who studied for a test and has passed the exam, and it's just a matter of uh, what reward we get for it. In 1 Corinthians 4, God actually tells us that each person will receive praise from God at a judgment like this. And so God is going to praise you. He's going to tell you the good things that you did. I think the bad is, is that there are going to be a lot of things in this life that we did that were worthless. We're not going to get scolded for everything. We're just not going to get rewarded for things that are worthless. And so this judgment, uh, God sees everything. He sees our motive. He sees why we do what we do. He sees what we do, what we pray, every tear. I'm reminding you, God sees everything. And do you think that Christians, that after they've come to the Lord, who do evil and do wrong and, and do people wrong, that, oh, no, it's, nothing's going to happen. That's, that's fine. Just do whatever you want. No, God's not like that either. And there is, a, there is an awesomeness and a reverence for God that we should have, even as believers, knowing that we're going to face His awesome presence. I don't want to disappoint the Lord. I want to be as faithful to Him as I can. And I hope that you do too. Let's try to make it simple here. We are going to be judged by God individually. It won't matter in the sense that we're not being rewarded by the church we went to or how well we did as a group. It's the individual and their faithfulness or performance or, if I can say, actions uh, of spirituality and relationship with the Lord that will be judged. And so it's individuals in the sense that it says all will be there. That's true, every person. But it also will be individual. Maybe, um, like most churches, maybe you go to a church that you feel like, I wish the church was stronger. I wish we had this. I wish we had that. I wish we had the other thing. But here's the main thing, is that we get an opportunity to be part of the community of God. And no matter what the weaknesses are or what the church doesn't have, it's not about that with your spiritual success. Because that's as man sees it. That's as people see it successful or not. How many people go there, what programs they have. No, that's all good. But I'm saying that we are judged as individuals by what we do, or what we give, what we've prayed, what we've invested. And so uh, it's individually. We're judged individually. Secondly, we're judged fairly and perfectly. God knows all things. Now, I will say this, I've watched a lot of professional basketball lately. It seems like nobody ever thinks they foul. <laughs> they argue with the officials a lot. They raise their hands and give the look like, what, me? I didn't, and then the replay shows, whack, <laughs> you know? And you go, how could they think they didn't foul and something like that? And they're complaining to the referee. Well, instant replay uh, changes things. I was also watching a, a judo match. I just randomly turned on the Olympics and there was a judo match and it was in the last 24 to 30 seconds and you could see they had the robes on, the judo robes, and they were leaning on one another and they were kind of pulling on one another and I wasn't quite sure what's legal or illegal, but they were trying to look in there and the commentator mentioned, well, you can't pull somebody down or anything like that. So they were making sure they weren't pulling and they couldn't tell. And all of a sudden, what happens is, is one got pushed over, and I guess that's a point. The match was 0-0, and he rolled so briefly that they had to call timeout and decide if it was a point or not. Of course, the guy went on his back, said, no, no, it's not. And the one who, you know, kind of pushed him a little bit, he pushed him enough, and uh, he rolled over, but wasn't quick enough, wasn't long enough for a point. Well, this was going to decide a bronze medal in the Olympics, so they took it to instant replay. It was a very close call. The call, the commentator said, could have went either way. You know what the call was? They scored it as a point. You had one happy guy and one unhappy. And it took the instant replay for them to decide, you know what, God doesn't need instant replay. He sees everything in slow-mo, if you will, our freeze frame. He sees it for what it is. There's nothing that God misses. 
there's an awe to that as an awesome responsibility and a fear, a reverence for God that we should have with that. But also we should realize that God is a God who judges fairly and honestly, and he is for us, not against us. That's why he sent Jesus. And when we go to this, we're going to get every reward that we really do have coming. And we're not going to get what we really didn't do. This is the age where in kids sports, everybody gets a participation trophy. And that's all the same. And that's, that's fine, I guess. But when we go to heaven, it's not all going to be the same. You hear people talk about, well, they'll just throw their crowns or their rewards before Jesus, and that will be it, and then everybody will be the same. Well, actually, it teaches that we throw our rewards before him, but it doesn't teach that everything will be the same. Um, so the third thing, individually, fairly, slash, perfectly, and the third way that we'll be judged is completely. That is, in detail or fully. There's nothing that God won't miss. He's going to give us everything that we have coming. But we asked this question, briefly said, how do we get rewards? Let's look at that next. So the title of this program is called Going for the Gold. It's, you know, it's wonderful to have bronze and silver. It's wonderful to medal. It's good to have any reward. It will be meaningful. It will all matter. But we have to ask ourselves, how do we get these rewards? Well, generally, we could say by living a life of, life of faith. That's true. Just by living a life of faith and following God, we'll be rewarded. But let's go to Romans 14.10, and one scripture will tell you a lot. Now, we can't exhaust everything here, but we'll go for a lot in just a few minutes. Romans 14.10 reads, You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? He's talking to believers here. Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Okay, so there's an implication here. And the implication in what it's saying is, is that believers treat other believers, and I might add, people with respect, not with contempt. And we don't need to spend our time judging their life. We're here to help people. Any diagnosis we need to do is simply uh, trying to figure out, okay, how can we help people? So one way that we can really build eternal rewards is simply how we treat people. Treat people well. Now, let's go into 1 Corinthians 3, and it will um, say 11 through 15, and it reads like this. This is talking about where we get to silver and gold and, and other things. So let me read it to you. For if you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? So God is differentiating in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 3, saying that you can be fleshly or you can be full of jealousy and you're not going to get rewarded for that. We're going to get rewarded for treating people well. Now, let's go to verse 11. For no one can lay any foundation other than one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. So it gives the idea here of building a temple, building a house. You have to know the Lord first you have to make heaven. Then you're eligible for rewards. Now verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation, what, what foundation? Faith in Jesus. If the, anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, or wood, hay, or straw, see the different materials? And so there's different things that we can use to build our life. Now, their work, verse 13, will be shown for what it is, because the day, capital D, the judgment day, or Bema Seat judgment day, will bring it to light. That's the purpose of that judgment for believers, to separate the works that are worth uh, reward and those that are worthless, and will bring it to light. And it says it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Notice it doesn't say quantity. 
It's not about how long, like forever is eternal life. It's about the quality. This is a judgment testing the quality of the work in your life or the faith and what caused you to work in for Jesus in this life. So go back to verse 12. Using the foundation, there's gold, silver, costly stones. These that are elements that are going to survive. And then there's actions and things that are of wood, hay, or straw. Right now, uh, in Washington, Oregon, California, completely in the West, I'm broadcasting from uh, Washington State. And there's wildfires everywhere. We're talking about the fire that tests. And they try to put out these wildfires through lightning strikes. There's been many all over the three states and a few more states. And these fires are just running wild and many houses are destroyed. I think I heard on the news last night that at one place there were 60 to 70 houses that were burnt to the ground. I'm looking at a picture here of a, of a wood stove and a house that was, and all that I see is the foundation. I see a burned out car. I see a chimney. Uh, I see a few uh, walls and everything's just burned. And it just took it down to the ground. And the fire of the Holy Spirit is only going to destroy the works that are worthless. That is the straw. Straw burns fast. So does dry grass. And so wood, hay, straw, that burns off. But the things that matter, the things that we did for Jesus, for the kingdom of God, acts of faith for eternity will be rewarded. Those are gold and silver and the costly stones. So God is going to show us and bring it to reveal it for what it is. And we're going to receive that reward, each person. Now, verse 14, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. Verse 15, our last verse, if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. And that's where you get people talking about burned britches, but hey, I made heaven. Woohoo! I'm here. Okay. Well, that's good. That's a lot better than uh, not making it. But seriously, and on a serious note, it's a tragic to see these fires, these wildfires burn people's houses and the treasures that they built up, what they've worked hard for. But when we are in this judgment, we're not going to lose worthwhile things we will only lose things that didn't make the cut. So what is the takeaway from all this? Let's live a life of faith. Let's live a life in community with believers. Let's treat people well. Let's let the Spirit of God move in us as well as through us. It's not just about doing good works. It's about letting God work in us. Every prayer, Every time we read the Bible, we may not feel it, but it's changing us, it's sanctifying us, it's purifying us from glory to glory. How do you stop the flames of destruction? With water. Uh, you pour the water out. And in the same way, how do you stop a destructive force, destructive desires in your life or in the lives of others? By reading, by praying. It sounds so simple, but God, when you get connected to Him, what happens is that he burns off the worthless things and starts giving you a deeper purpose. My challenge in parting today, let's live a life, you and I, of deeper purpose, of meaning. Let's go for the gold. Let's go for something that matters. Let's go for something that survives. As a minister, I've done many, many funerals. I've never heard anybody talk about how much was in a bank account. I know it matters in this life. I get it, it matters to me too but not as much as the significance of what we've done for the Lord. That will last forever. That's the challenge. Live a life of faith. You can do this. Greater is He, the Holy Spirit. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. God's grace is greater than the things you, you face. Even your own flesh, even your past, whatever it is, Go for the gold. Let's do this in Jesus' name. Amen.